Hi all, welcome to our class on the book of Psalms. Uh, with this class session, we are moving into a different part of the Hebrew Bible canon. Uh, so up till now this semester, we have talked about the prophets. Uh, we focused on the prophetic books. There's uh, been a couple other uh, books we've talked about, like for example, um, Ezra and Nehemiah, which Professor Yoder introduced uh, this uh, beginning of this week. But uh, the books of Ezra and Nehemiah we brought in uh, because they talk about the Persian period. So another way to think about this semester is that we started with the 8th century BC uh, and the, con the prophets uh, who spoke to that context, remember Amos and Micah and Isaiah, right, and Hosea. Uh, and then we moved uh, to the Persian, uh, sorry, to the, uh, the exile, uh, the Babylonian exile in the, the period of the destruction of Jerusalem and the aftermath. And we talked about Lamentations, so a non-prophetic book, but a book that deals with that time period. But then also the prophetic books of Ezekiel, of Jeremiah, of Second Isaiah. Uh, and then we talked about the uh, return to the land, uh, what we might call the Persian period uh, that was uh, uh, introduced uh, with uh, uh, Third Isaiah and Haggai uh, and Zechariah uh, and Malachi, uh, but also uh, with the uh, books of Ezra and Nehemiah. Um, now we're moving into a different part of the course. Uh, we're moving into a different part of the biblical canon. We're moving away from what we might call the prophetic books and into um, the uh, the writings. Um, if uh, for, for Jewish uh, uh, readers of the Bible, the, uh, the Bible divides into three uh, different uh, categories. Uh, the Torah, so the first five books of the Bible, uh, the Nevi'im, or the prophets, and they would put the former prophets and the latter prophets as two parts of the, the prophetic works. For them, the former prophets are like Joshua and Judges, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings. And then the latter prophets, the, the, the biblical books of the prophets, what Christians would call the prophetic literature. Um, but now we're moving into the writings, um, which uh, in Hebrew uh, is the Ketuvim, um, this uh, kind of third grab bag, really, part of the Bible that includes uh, the Psalms, but also includes uh, the wisdom literature, which we'll move into next, includes the Song of Songs, which includes uh, uh, some of the short stories, um, some, some, parts, some parts of the Bible that Christians would put in different places, but in the Jewish canon really makes a lot of sense um, in this uh, kind of third catch-all uh, part of the Bible. Um, even in the New Testament, we can see some of this forming. Um, you know, Jesus talks about the law and the prophets, and then also um, David. Uh, as a part of the canon. Um, this is what the David part of the canon is. Um, we'll get to David's role in it in just a moment, um, uh, which I think can be uh, uh, fairly interesting. Um, but <clears throat> Uh, so let's just note that we are moving into this new part of the Bible, um, the writings, and that we'll stay there uh, basically until the end of the semester when we come back to Daniel, uh, who Christians call a prophet, but for uh, for Jewish readers is in uh, is in the writings. Um, so. First things first, the Psalms are the part of the Bible that is our words to God. That is, it's it's the human part of the Bible. Um, well, all the Bible's got humans in it, right? And it's all mediated by humans. That is, humans tell the stories that are in the Bible, and they write them and pass them down and so on and edit them. Uh, but however, a lot of the Bible focuses on God's word, God's revelation to us. Um, uh, in the Psalms, we really get purely human words to God. Uh, sometimes God speaks through the Psalms, but it's speaking to us as a response to our words. That is, uh, the Psalms are spoken as I, meaning a human, or us, we, humans, and what we feel about God. And it's really important, I think, to take this seriously. So, I think Christians love the Psalms, but often they are uh, terribly misunderstood, um, I think, as biblical books. Um, this also leads to the fact that Christians kind of tear apart the Psalms. Um, we, we, we only sing parts of them in churches, but don't sing other parts that we don't like. Uh, or when we read them, we sometimes feel uh, confused or upset. Uh, if you've noticed, a lot of the Psalms are angry, upset, worrisome, grieving, even cursing, even hoping for the death of enemies, right? I mean, there's some pretty nasty stuff in the Psalms. Um, if you've ever read Psalm 137, verse 9, uh, this is a troublesome verse, right? Uh, uh, blessed be the one who bashes babies' heads against the rock, right? Um, the, there are things in the Psalms that make us uh, kind of recoil in disgust. Uh, I think it's crucial for us to understand um, that these things are there for a reason, um, that these things are there, uh, that those, uh, uh, really the, the vast majority of the Psalter is uncomfortable to read, um, uh, in part because it's such a rich resource for our own life. Uh, these are words that we are given to say, uh, to give voice and shape to things that we don't even know how to say. Our greatest joys when we're brought up short and we can't even really explain what we feel. We're given words for that. But also, 
uh, all of our grief, uh, which is hard to put into words, all of our anger, all of our frustration, even our hatred is given words. Um, John Calvin, uh, who some of you may know, um, uh, the uh, famous Reformed theologian, um, he wrote a commentary in the book of Psalms, and by the way, it's a great commentary. Um, uh, I am not one who is known to go and read John Calvin, um, but his commentary in the book of Psalms uh, is beautiful. And uh, uh, he calls it in the introduction, um, he says that the book of Psalms is an anatomy of all parts of the human soul. He says, and here's a quote, there is not an emotion of which anyone can be conscious that is not here represented as if in a mirror. All of the griefs and sorrows and fears and doubts and hopes and cares and perplexities with which the minds of men and women are wont to be agitated can be found here in the book of Psalms. It's an anatomy. Uh, as, you've ever, as you know, if you've, if you've ever kind of like accidentally um you know happened on one of those uh shows like the on discovery channel or something like that you know late at night you're kind of cruising the channels and all of a sudden you you see an like a, a surgery happening and you see uh someone's guts on display um you, you know that that feeling of recoil or disgust um uh if you've ever been in person to see a surgery um you know you'll see that the the inside of the human body is not beautiful um but it's useful all of those disgusting things inside of us that we spend a lot of time trying to hide, um, those things all have a function and we depend upon them. And in the same way, uh, Calvin is saying that uh, the book of Psalms is an anatomy. It's opening up what is really inside all of us and putting it on display. Um, uh, it's not beautiful. Uh, at least not all parts are equally beautiful, um, and uh, some parts are make us uncomfortable, but they all exist for a function and a reason, and discovering the reason for them might be important. Um, so we look at all the parts of the soul, uh, and uh, it's this presence of these uncomfortable parts of faith, I think, that mark the Psalter, and that uh, will help us give voice to those things that are actually important for us to say, even if we don't feel like they are. I think uh, in lots of uh, contemporary American Christianity, we we are told that we should be happy all the time, and we've overcome all things. And you know, uh, if you're sad or angry or upset, you're showing that God didn't really uh, win at the cross, or the resurrection didn't really happen, or something. Um, you know, you're you're supposed to have the power of positive thinking all the time. Um, I think when you read the Psalms, that uh, you'll see that most of the Psalms um, are pretty far from that point of view. And since these are the words that are given to us to say in the Bible, uh, um, I think we should we should pause at that point and, and really think. Um, it's also important for us to think about what, what the Psalms are. Uh, at, at most elemental form, they're poetry. Uh, as you know from Professor Yoder's lecture at the beginning of this semester, uh, poetry is uh, uh, a different way to use words, right? It's art that focuses on the words themselves as the vehicle for uh, producing the art. Um, there, it's regular language lifted up to be an artistic form, um, speech made unusual, uh, and uh, language put to a special purpose is what one linguist called it. Um, or uh, to paraphrase Emily Dickinson, Emily Dickinson, uh, she said that poetry is supposed to uh, uh, make your head explode. Um, so I think that the, at its best it can do that, and we'll try to get to some um, pretty interesting parts of poetry um, uh, that, as they exist in the Psalms uh, for a little bit. Just as a note here, most American English translations are not great um, about the poetry because they're trying so hard to represent the ancient Hebrew words themselves, but also sometimes they try to venture into poetry, and biblical scholars like me are not great poets. Um, there is some good work being done on the poetry of the Psalms, um, but there's not as many great translations of the Psalms that, that respect their poetry. Robert Alter's translation is pretty good. The New Jerusalem Bible uh, uh, is it's a, an originally a French translation. Um, that's a, a pretty good uh, version of the Psalms, um, but we, we're still awaiting a really great um, poetic reading of the Psalter. Um, honestly, King James is probably the best English translation of the Psalms um, that exists, and just in terms of poetry. Uh, so, in any event, um, uh, this poetry uh, in the ancient world, um, this, these poems, these Psalms, at least many of them, uh, clearly got their start as songs. That is, that there was music associated with this poetry. Um, unfortunately for us, we don't really know that much about how music worked in the ancient world. Here's a Neo-Assyrian, this right here, a Neo-Assyrian uh, uh, wall sculpture. Um, it's a, a sculpture of two musicians that are playing uh, harp-like things, uh, lyres we might call them, L-Y-R-E, -Y -Y not L-I-A-R, I'm sorry. 
but uh, so a lyre uh, or some kind of lute-like instrument, um, a harp might be another way to talk about it. Um, but uh, the psalterion was a kind of harp. Um, so the, here, here's some folks playing a psalterion. Um, that's a Greek word for this kind of instrument that ended up becoming the name of the books, the Psalms in Greek, and then for the Christian tradition. Uh, in Hebrew, the name of the book is tahalim or praises. Um, so we, we've got a little bit of a different, I mean, Neither of them are great names uh, for the book. Uh, Tehillim praises uh, is actually only naming um, less than a third of the book, which is which is praise. Um, but in any event, uh, th so this mu ancient music you'll you'll can find some stuff on YouTube of people trying to recreate ancient Near Eastern music. I don't think any of it's very convincing. We don't really know how to read their ancient uh, ancient musical notations. Um, but we, what we do know is they were they were highly musical people, uh, and there was music kind of all over these these cultures and songs um, all over the culture. And so these were actually sung and enacted. Um, these were liturgical uh, events, uh, many of them. Uh, so a lot of the musical notations that we've got now, like on the eighth, that might mean an octave, it might mean an eight-stringed instrument, it might mean some number of beats per minute. Uh, we, we have no idea um, what these uh, musical notations mean. Or salah. Salah might mean uh, a musical break or a musical interlude or playing the melody but with music, music, musical instruments only, or it could mean a refrain of some kind, or it could mean I broke a string, sorry, got to, got to change it. We have no idea what Salah means. Um, uh, but uh, what we do, uh, in part, what we do know is that, that what we're looking at when we look at the Psalms is at least in part uh, ancient Israel's hymn book, or actually lots of different little hymn books that were edited together, and then with some other kinds of poems added to them, like Psalm 1, um, one of the latest Psalms, I think, to be added to the Psalter, um, which suggests that people began after a long period of time to read the Psalms and meditate on them and think about them and so on, uh, read them by themselves. Um, this seems to be a very late activity. Uh, and so when Psalm 1 says that you're supposed to read these things and mutter them or meditate upon them, the word there actually is haga or say them or like mumble them. You're supposed to be mumbling these Psalms over and over again. Uh, that, that's a little bit removed from their ancient context of being used uh, in, in praise and prayer, uh, in public, public uh, uh, music. So all to say this the, the, the setting for the Psalms, um, uh, we'll get to different settings that might have existed, uh, but they're, they're musical things, um, and we're missing some of that ancient context. Uh, Another thing that is important is that you know David was a musician according to the, to the book of Samuel, um, and David is all over the Psalms. Um, what's important for us to note, though, is that these um, uh, superscriptions, we call them, these kind of introductions to a lot of the Psalms that mention David and then mention other people as well, like Asaph and Korah, um, and even Solomon gets his own Psalm. Uh, but a lot of these... Um, uh, the, all of these superscriptions to the Psalms that kind of give a context and oftentimes name moments in David's life that, that go along with these Psalms, these are, these are clearly very late. Uh, these are much later than the Psalms themselves. So if you look at like Psalm 3, if you open up to Psalm 3, it says a Psalm of David when he fled from his son Absalom. Uh, these Psalms often give kind of uh, settings in life that would uh, show you when you would use a psalm like this. Um, but it, it's pretty clear to us that a lot of these actually don't come from these events. Um, and it was so clear, in fact, that when the verses were made for the Bible, uh, that you'll notice that these superscriptions are not verses. Like, you know, chap Psalm 3, verse 1 begins, O Lord, how many are my foes? Um, because so many of the manuscripts of the Psalms, even in the Middle Ages, they recognized that the superscriptions didn't all match and they moved around a lot and uh, some of them just kind of vanished for some manuscripts. We found a lot of manuscripts uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls and these superscriptions are just all over the place. Um, so what we've got is a um, fairly generic representation of one strand of medieval um, manuscripts in the, in, in the Hebrew tradition, but um, these are these are uh, looking back on uh, uh, on these psalms, uh, the super superscriptions. I'm looking back on these psalms from a much later date, trying to figure out when could this have come from. Uh, think of uh, David really as like a um, uh, the the theme, the the, the kind of. Uh, core emblem or like mascot of the Psalter, in the same way that Moses is associated with the Torah but didn't write all of it, um, David is associated with uh, the Psalms. And he clearly didn't write all of them because, you know, uh, a lot of the Psalms, the superscriptions even say that Solomon wrote this or Korah wrote that. Um, uh, but one thing we can say is that the Hebrew form here is Le David. So a Psalm of David in the superscription of Psalm 3. Psalm 3, verse 0, or whatever, if you want to talk about it. A Psalm of David. Le David. It says a Psalm, a mizmor, a poem. A poem, Le David. And Le David in Hebrew is really interesting because it means two or four David, really. It might mean possession, like David owns it, but it 
it's not the thing that, that's used, it's not the Hebrew uh, form that is used, the grammatical form, used um, to describe when someone creates something. So here's a lamellic jar, these jars from ancient Israel that have a lamed and then a, a la, and then the name of the person afterwards here, melech or king, like two or for the king. You know, the king didn't make what's in those jars. Those are taxes that are going to the king. Uh, and they're for the king, they're dedicated to the king. Um, so uh, here's a, another close-up of the seal here of uh, uh, Hezekiah, um, you know, to the king here, uh, lamellic. Um, so you can say that this kind of uh, la melech or to the king or la david for for David. Uh, one way to think about this is kind of like in the in the line of David or in the uh, sort of um, lineage of David or dedicated to David or like a, a psalm like David used to do. Um, and many of the psalms are just introduced uh, in the superscription as la david um, with nothing else more than that. So that is to say it's one of those David like psalms or songs. Um, so that's, that, that's how I would talk about these superscriptions. But one of the things we can see from these superscriptions is that there's lots of like little collections of books that all have the same superscription um, within the book of Psalms. And those are pretty interesting. So if you just turn with me real quick to, uh, to Psalm uh, 42. This is just an example here. Psalm 42 uh, starts what we might call the Psalms of Korah. So if you just look here at Psalm 42 in the... the um, uh, superscription says to the leader, uh, probably the the choir leader or something, music leader, a uh, masquil. Uh, this is uh, uh, kind of a, a poem um, that is uh, in a way um, uh, kind of a puzzle almost. Um, a masquil uh, of the Korah heights. So it's uh, one of the Korah songs. And then look at uh, uh, Psalm 44 to the leader of the Korah heights, a masquil. And then 45 to the leader according to the lilies. Is that like a, a theme or? Um, uh, some sort of uh, beat or rhythm. Um, it might be a melody, we don't know. Of the Korah Heights, a masculine, a love song. Uh, so you can see this is part of this Korah Heights altar. If you turn with me to uh, Psalm 120. 120 starts a new version, like a new, a new little book. I mean, uh, a, little, a, a little psalter within the psalter, a little prayer book. Uh, and that's a song of ascents. If you look at 121, a song of ascents. 122, a song of ascents of David. 123, A Song of Ascents. Um, this seems to be a collection that's rather late, uh, Persian period perhaps, um, or even early Hellenistic, uh, of people who are making pilgrimages to Jerusalem, ascending, going up. Jerusalem's in, in, the, in the hill country, so if you're going anywhere, really you'd have to go up to Jerusalem. Um, so a, ascending to Jerusalem, a song of these pilgrims. Um, so all, all to say, these, these uh, uh, superscriptions kind of tell us some things about these, uh, about these psalms, but also of the, of the book of psalms and how it formed as a whole. It formed over a long period of time, uh, and one of the other things we know from looking at the most ancient manuscripts we have from the Bible, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, we can see that the book of Psalms formed unevenly. Uh, so we have several different manuscripts of the book of Psalms at Qumran. Qumran is the modern day name for this place. We actually don't know what they called it back then, but the Dead Sea Scroll community. And there are these caves here that you see in these rocks where they hid uh, their uh, massive library uh, before the Romans came and destroyed uh, the, the settlement at Qumran um, sometime around the year 70 um, uh, AD. Uh, but these are the oldest manuscripts of the Bible that we have, these uh, Dead Sea Scrolls. And in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have things like 11Q Psalm A. 11Q means the 11th cave at Qumran. Um, this place in the middle of the, come next to the Dead Sea. Um, so the 11th, uh, cave at Qumran or Qumran, um, and then Psalm A, the, the first Psalm manuscript found there. And here's some images of it. And this one, uh, so uh, it's got uh, Psalms 1 through 42, uh, almost exactly like we have them uh, in our Bibles. So that's to say the first book of the Psalms is really well preserved. And then after that, it kind of falls apart in terms of uh, corresponding to our our uh, uh, our Psalter. So book two is, is pretty much there. And then book three starts to be less organized. And then books four and five just aren't there at all. And instead you have these exorcistic Psalms um, of David, and then at the very, very end, there's this little notation that uh, David wrote like 10,000 Psalms, and of course we can't have all of them. So there was this expectation, even at the time of Jesus, this is this this was written at the time of Jesus. So at the time of Jesus, um, there was an expectation that, that there were too many Psalms, you couldn't have all of them in one book, um, and the ones that we had, they're going to be different, there are different forms of them, that's fine, um, just like there's different versions of the, of the Presbyterian hymnal or the Methodist Baptist hymnal, um, right? there's different forms of that that exist, and they're not, one's not wrong just because there's another version out there. So this is how they perceived the Psalms working. And then, of course, after the destruction of the temple, 
in Jerusalem, there was a, a lockdown in terms of uh, the, the Psalter and really the biblical text as a whole. There was this attempt to preserve it um, rather than keep adding to it and, and keep editing it and making it grow. Uh, so it's a much longer story for another time. But just to say uh, what we can see from some of this evidence is that book one is probably the oldest part of the, of the Psalms. And by the way, if you just start, um, go turn to Psalm 1 with me real quick, and you'll see at the beginning it says book 1, Psalms 1 through 41. Now that, that's not in the Bible, that's the editor telling you this, but um, at the end of Psalm 41, in the Hebrew manuscripts, the ancient Hebrew, it says the end of book 1. And then at the, uh, so if you turn to Psalm 41 with me, you'll see uh, it says uh, at the end of uh, Psalm 41, uh, there's a blessing. Psalm 41, verse 13, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen. That's not the end of Psalm 41. That's the end of book one of the Psalms. It's like a little blessing at the end of that book. Every, blo every book ends with a little blessing. Uh, book two of the Psalms begins there, and then it's Psalms 42 through 72. There's five books of Psalms within the book of Psalms as a whole, and they seem to kind of uh, build one another. And uh, also, um, uh, they... Uh, they're, the oldest one is book one, the second oldest is book two, and so as you move on in time, you're going, actually going like later in history. Now, some of the psalms at the end in book five may have been written really early, but just collected and added to the to the edited edition at the very end. So we can't have complete um, surety about dating um, when we look at these books, but to say that they, this is when they were collected and added together, and we get this kind of building, rolling corpus of uh, the Psalter um, over time. And to all of them, like with all of this, uh, David is kind of the patron saint in a way. Um, they didn't have patron saints back then, but that is a way for us to think about it, um, of the Psalms. So just in the same way that Moses was the patron saint of the Torah uh, and ended up uh, kind of being um, named as the author of all of them, even if uh, Moses clearly wasn't the author of all of them, uh, especially the part at the end when Moses dies, he didn't write that. But still, he's kind of associated with all of them. In the same way, David um, is associated with a Torah-like thing, right? There's five books of the Psalms. Woo, five, you know. It's clearly uh, meant to be kind of like the Torah um, or another way to think about the Torah. And Psalm 1 is written to really convince us that this is the Torah. It uses the word Torah uh, that is the instruction of God. So we're supposed to mutter on this instruction day and night, um, and that is the instruction of God uh, uh, for us how, how to praise and how to, how to pray and how to, how to grieve, how to uh, get, you know, show our joy uh, and, our, and even our cursing. Um, so all to say, uh, this is uh, part of this kind of a uh, complex and really interesting uh, book of Psalms. Uh, so in terms of setting, let's let's um, look again at like uh, uh, different places that these Psalms might have occurred. One of the things I love, really love about the Psalter uh, is that you can see rubrics sometimes. You know, like uh, like when you uh, look at a leaflet, like for uh, for for a service, you're like looking, you know, kind of open up the leaflet. You can see. You know, oh, I'm supposed to say this, and you're supposed to say that. You can see that stuff sometimes in the Psalms, and it is awesome. So turn with me real quick uh, to Psalm 24. This is so great. Uh, we can see from this that many of these Psalms, uh, at least at least some of them, but probably a lot of them, had a setting in the temple, in the temple in Jerusalem. So what we end up looking at is really an, uh, the, the hymn book of the Temple of Jerusalem up to a point uh, when we look at the Psalms. And in chapter 24, so chapter, they don't really work with chapters, right? Uh, but Psalm 24. Um, uh, of David, a psalm, that's the superscription, but it begins, the earth is the Lord's, the earth is Yahweh's, and all that's in it, the world, and those who live in it. For he, God has esta established it, founded it on the seas, and established it on the rivers. So God built the earth. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in God's holy place? Those who have clean hands and pure hearts, who do not lift up their souls to what is false, and do not swear deceitfully. They will receive blessing from Yahweh and vindication from the God of their salvation. Such is the company of those who seek God, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Um, this is probably a liturgy, an entrance liturgy to the temple. So somebody shouts out, a priest shouts out, Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in the holy place? And then the people all shout back who want to get in. Hey, those who have clean hands and pure hearts. It's a way of saying, hey, we, we know, we know the rules and we followed them. You know, we, we're, we're going we're gonna to do great here. Uh, let us in, you know. And then verse 7 shifts to a, another liturgy. This is a different kind of entrance liturgy. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Um, so why, the king of glory, it's clearly God, right? So why is God coming in? Why would God be coming into the temple? Well, do you remember what talked about the Ark of the Covenant being the mobile presence of God so that God is understood to sit on the mobile throne, right, as the people kind of bring it in uh, to the temple? Well, here, uh, who is the king? Of the, lift up your heads, O gates. Be lifted up, O ancient doors. 
Lift up your heads, O gates. Who is the king of glory? Yahweh, strong and mighty. Yahweh, mighty in battle. So Yahweh went out to battle with the with the, the people of Israel, came back in, and we've got we're asking the doors to lift their heads. Because Yahweh sitting on the throne is so big that even these giant doors of the temple, right? This giant door right here to the temple, even that's too small. Yahweh's gonna bump, we don't want to bump the divine head on, on the door, right? So we've got to ask the doors to raise their heads, raise and to get up out of the way of Yahweh's head. Right? Who is this King of Glory? The Lord of hosts. That's the King of Glory. So this is an entrance liturgy that people would chant and shout and sing and celebrate when uh, Yahweh, and uh, imagined to be on top of the uh, Ark of the Covenant, um, uh, came back into the city. Um, there's other uh, psalms, too, that just kind of show their liturgy um, just kind of on the outside. Um, there's uh, some uh, really wonderful ones uh, here. Let me uh, show you. Uh, so uh, 124, Psalm 124. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side... And then it says, let Israel now say, and then it repeats if it had not been the Lord who was on our side. And then the rest of it doesn't repeat. What this is, is a liturgy. It's a call and response liturgy. The priest shouts out, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, and then the priest shouts, let Israel now say, that is, y'all follow me. And then the second part, of the second time it's repeated, that's the people shouting it back to the priest. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, but then now that you understand that's how it works, they don't give you that for the rest of the, of the psalm. Uh, when our enemies attacked us, when our enemies attacked us, then they would have swallowed us up alive. Then they would have swallowed us up alive, right? So this kind of back and forth thing, you can see that in some of these um, some of these psalms. Uh, there's really some some beautiful stuff you can see too. Uh, there's a, uh, um, well, anyway, I, I've got to let you, let, I've got to move on. But there's more examples of this kind of liturgy showing up in the psalms. Um, and it's beautiful. It shows us uh, that these things were used in the temple. Um, so some of the like uh, prayers of lament and grief, this would have been someone coming to the temple saying, I lost my, my loved one. Uh, they're gone. And the, the priest of the temple tells them, hey, pray this prayer of anger. Pray this prayer of grief. Pray this prayer of suffering and sorrow. It's pastoral care. We're seeing pastoral care in action for people who need it when we read the Psalms that would have occurred at places like the temple um, or even uh, at local sanctuaries. Here's a little image um, of, a, of a procession, of a liturgical procession from ancient Mesopotamia. You can see people processing and have their arms in the, in the air. They're shouting and praising. And then there's people with big harps that are playing their harps. And then down here, you can see that there's a procession going on um, with uh, little arcs of the covenant, right? They're, these are arcs with... Uh, um, uh, thrones on them, right? Mobile thrones. And you can see the statues of other Mesopotamian, you know, this isn't Yahweh here, but these are Mesopotamian gods being uh, processed probably into a city. Um, uh, and we can imagine this would have happened with the Ark of the Covenant too. Uh, Yahweh invisibly, no no statue on there, like these are statues of gods down here. But there would have been no statue of the Yahweh, but Yahweh would have been invisibly kind of marched into the, the temple. Um, we can also see some of these probably would have been used at local shrines. So people couldn't always go to Jerusalem for their pastoral care. Um, if you make a vow to God that you're going to say a praise to God and bring a sacrifice, um, uh, if God helps you, and then God helps you, and you know, the, whatever you're sick, and you say, if I get better, I'm going to vow to praise God in the temple. You say, okay, great. Well, maybe you can't go to the, all the way to the temple, so maybe you go to your local sanctuary. Um, now, I know that Deuteronomy says you're not supposed to have local sanctuaries. You're not supposed to have these high places. They always had them, right? That's what the prophets are all mad about. Deuteronomy is all mad about it. The books of Kings are always mad about it. They, they always had local shrines um, uh, wherever they were uh, until uh, after the time of the exile. So we have these. This is an ancient um, uh, four-horned altar from Beersheba, uh, from, from Judah, from the south. So we know that there would have been local sa sacrifices and so on um, happening at all of these uh, sanctuaries. And they would have uh, had, they would have used things like the Psalms. Uh, some of them ended up in our book of Psalms. Lots of them didn't. I'm sure that they had thousands uh, of ancient praise songs and lament songs and so on um, and used in liturgies all throughout uh, uh, all throughout Israel and Judah. But some of them made it and some of them didn't. The ones that made it, they made it because people loved to use them. And this is a, maybe an interesting thing too. Uh, when they got used and passed down, they got shop-worn. That is to say, if you ever read the Psalms and you read, like, let's say the Psalms of Lament and you read them and you're like, well, this person is sick and they're they're sad and also everyone's abandoned them and they have enemies coming after them nothing is specific they're never like bob can, bob, bob god bob is hurting me can you please stop bob from hurting me there's never names of enemies in here 
There's a couple of psalms like the ones where the Babylonians are trying to get you that are a little more specific, but still they're pretty generic. That means like uh, there's there's not much specific imagery here um, that would help you to see like what kind of sickness is this person sick with. They're generic because they've been they've had the edges cut off, right? They're they're, they're it, they've been made so that you can use them. You meaning whoever, whoever in the world can say yes, I feel sick. Uh, and then also there's enemies after me, but just very vague enemies. You can fill it with whatever you want. And think of it this way. You can also fill it with any any kind of enemy you want, right? Uh, is cancer coming after you or after a loved one? That's that's your enemy, right? You, poetically, you can kind of fill these things in. Uh, maybe the, um, the economy is your enemy right now, uh, or maybe your boss, uh, or maybe uh, just uh, maybe feelings of anxiety are your enemy right now. That is to say, these psalms were meant to be um, put on and used uh, in lots of different settings. But uh, another ancient setting that we can say, um, these things were sometimes used personally or in families. Um, this is uh, a, a piece of rock that was cut off of uh, a tomb near Jerusalem uh, called Kirbet al Kom. That's the name of the place. Um, it's a, just a, just a little bit from Jerusalem, and uh, this is uh, this was right above the tomb of Uriyahu. Uh, Uriyahu was a Yahwist, um, a good a good Jerusalemite uh, uh, who loved Yahweh and uh, who left um, this carving, um, which is an upside down hand. Um, maybe it's the hand of God, like the protection of God, or it could be like you're supposed to put your hand kind of on that and then pray this prayer. But above it, it's hard to see it here, but at the very top above the hand, there's an inscription. And that inscription is, is like a psalm. It's not a psalm. It's not in our book of psalms, but it's a prayer. It's a it's a personal prayer that says, blessed is your Yahoo and uh, blessed be the one who reads this poem and remembers him and so on. So uh, it's it's a, uh, we, we can see that p individual people were writing these things and coming up with them in local settings. Um, and then some of them got kind of spun into uh, uh, what we now have is the book of psalms. So all to say, this is a very deep and variegated, like there's, it's kind of like a layer cake, the book of Psalms with lots of different things that are included in it. Um, but if we spend time with, with each one of these individual poems uh, and try to give it its own um, uh, hearing, uh, we might be able to see uh, some of this ancient setting through it. Uh, all to say, this is a lot like the other kinds of uh, poems and songs that we would have heard in other nearby peoples. Psalm 29, for example, it's very clearly a hymn to Baal because Baal makes sense in the poetry and actually Yahweh doesn't. Um, but they, 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 uh, ancient Yahwehists loved the poem, so they took out Baal's name and put in Yahweh's. Um, uh, Psalm 104 sounds a lot like uh, the hymn to Aten uh, from Akhenaten from Egypt. Uh, so very clearly uh, the book of Psalms was, um, you know, just in the way that like uh, creative artists today sample each other. Well, some of this stuff is sampled um, uh, from other folks uh, in the nearby uh, region. Uh, but we should expect that, right? Ancient Israel was an ancient Near Eastern people. Okay, so uh, when when we come back to the next video, the next video we'll discuss um, a bit more about the setting in life, but also really uh, uh, thinking more about the particular ways that we talk about form criticism uh, and Hermann Gunkel's way of thinking about how did these Psalms actually work? Like what happened when you showed up to an ancient shrine? Uh, and we're thinking about trying to praise or grieve. What, what exactly happened? Uh, so we'll come back to that um, uh, uh, in the next video. Thanks.